So this will be a crash course on five JVM languages in 50 minutes if I can squeeze them all in. Uh, but first, I'm going to talk about natural language. Uh, so hopefully everybody speaks English because that will be helpful in this talk. Uh, so in English, we have uh, we use gender when we're referring to uh, an object that has a gender, right? Uh, if it's a per if it's a man, we say he. If it's a woman, we say she. But in Finnish, there is no gender. Uh, even if you're you're referring to a man or a woman, uh, you're still going to use the same pronoun. Uh, and it turns out that this difference in, in, the, in the use of the language affects the way people think about their own gender. So children who uh, speak, grow up speaking Finnish tend to become aware of their own gender uh, later in life than children who speak English or especially uh, who speak Hebrew, where they uh, have a gender for just about every object you refer to. Uh, so the point of that is the, the language that you speak changes the way you think. Uh, another example is in uh, how we refer to the future and the past. So in English, we have different verb forms for the different points in time we are referencing. Uh, but in a language like Chinese, uh, which is referred to as a futureless language, uh, the same verb form is used no matter uh, what point in time you're referring to. So literally, they would say, uh, it is raining tomorrow. And again, this affects the way uh, speakers of futureless languages uh, think. So uh, Speaker, people who speak these futureless languages tend to be better at preparing for the future. The idea is that uh, if the future is the same as the now, it's harder to procrastinate. Uh, so futureless language speakers uh, tend to have better health, they tend to save money better, and they're more likely to wear a condom. So uh, it's, the, the point is that natural languages change the way we think, and there's actually a name for this. Uh, it's called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Uh, if you saw the movie Arrival, it's, it's mentioned very briefly in there. Uh, but I have a hypothesis that the programming languages we choose change the way we think about the problems we're trying to solve. So given, two, uh, given the same problem and trying to solve it in two different languages, uh, you will come up with two different solutions, and one might be better than the other. So today I'm going to talk about five JVM languages that can change the way you think. Uh, but first, I'd like to talk about myself. I'm Joe Kuttner. I go by Codefinger on uh, IRC and Twitter and all the web places. Uh, I have worked with, uh, or I have built and maintained uh, production applications uh, in four of these uh, languages, all of them except Kotlin. Uh, the one I have the most experience with is JRuby. Uh, I wrote two books on deploying JRuby applications. Uh, but today I work at Heroku, where I am the JVM or Java languages uh, owner. Uh, so I'm responsible for making sure that all these languages work on our platform as a service uh, and that our customers who are using them uh, you know, have a good experience. Uh, so my day-to-day -day work is basically helping people with their problems uh, related to Java and these other languages. Uh, each of the technologies that I talk about today can be installed with SDK Man if you're on uh, a Bash-based system. Uh, so this is very easy if you are on uh, Mac, but also works on Bash for Windows if you're using Windows 10. Uh, SDK Man is a tool for managing different versions of uh, software tools at the command line. It can be used to install Java, uh, as well as all of the languages we'll talk about today. So if you see a command that you're not familiar with, it means I installed it with SDK Man. The first language I want to talk about is Groovy. And for each of the languages that I discuss, I'm going to make an analogy to a character in films or in movies. Uh, Groovy is like James Bond. It is a little adventurous. It's very good at getting things done. Uh, but in order to get things done, it occasionally has to break the rules. Uh, so it's you know, sort of doing the wrong thing for the right reasons, though. Uh, it's also a little sexy and sophisticated. So James Bond wears a suit while he's getting things done. Uh, Groovy's sophistication is that you can actually write Java code in a Groovy script, and it is valid syntax. So the Groovy syntax is a superset of the uh, Java syntax. Uh, but Groovy is also just Groovy. It's dynamic. It's uh, uh, very fun to use. Uh, it's object-oriented. It's dynamically typed. And it's strongly typed. So that puts it in this kind of interesting quadrant in programming language taxonomy, where it's not as uh, loosey-goosey as something like JavaScript, but it's not as rigid uh, as the Java language. So let's take a look at some example Groovy code. Uh, this is valid Groovy code. It also happens to be valid Java code. If we were to put this into an example.groovy script and run it, we would get a result. 
uh, but we would not have to compile it because Groovy is an interpreted language. Uh, it can be statically compiled, but the examples we'll look at are interpreted. Uh, so in this example, we just have a, a, a class with a main method, and inside of that main method, we're iterating over some integers, adding them up, and printing the result. Uh, but while this is valid Groovy, it's not idiomatic Groovy. Uh, if we want to make this more uh, Groovy-esque, we would, the first thing we would do is remove the semicolons. Those are optional in Groovy. Uh, then we, would, we could remove the class and the main method. That's boilerplate. That's not required in Groovy. Uh, we can also clean up that for loop. Uh, we can use the in keyword to iterate over a range of integers that we create using the dot dot notation. Uh, we can also get rid of the system dot out before our print line. Uh, that print line method is globally available. Uh, we can also get rid of the parentheses around the arguments to our method. So again, with Groovy, the idea is to remove as much of the boilerplate, as much of the characters that we don't need uh, as we're uh, building up our applications. So this now looks more like true Groovy code. Uh, but it's also kind of uh, a useless example. Uh, let's say we want to parameterize this so we can reuse this method. Uh, we, would, well, we would put it into a method. Uh, I'll call it Gaussify because Carl Gauss is known for like, this algorithm for adding these things up. Uh, we could have created the method with uh, public void like we do in Java, uh, but instead here I'm using the def keyword, which defines a dynamically typed method. So dynamically typed means that I do not have to specify the return type of this method, nor do I specify the type of the arguments that are being passed in. So in this case, I'm passing in A, which is an initial value, and R, which represents my range. Uh, but the runtime itself doesn't care what the type of those uh, objects is. So what that means is I, it is valid for me to pass in things other than integers. I can pass in strings, for example, which can also uh, be, uh, we can also create ranges from, from a string or from characters. Uh, but if I were to run it as it is now, I would actually get a uh, groovy cast exception. Because in the first line of my method, uh, I'm setting the initial value to a temporary integer variable. But I can fix that by, instead of defining the type of my sum variable using the def keyword to define a dynamically typed variable. Uh, and when I do this, I can invoke the method uh, with any type of object. Uh, the Groovy runtime doesn't care as long as it responds to the methods that, uh, that it needs to in the, uh, uh, in the body of my method. The, uh, so the use of the for loop and the temporary sum variable is still very uh, Java-like in its nature. Uh, to be even more Groovy-like, uh, we would use the, uh, the inject method on the range class. So range is a collection, and all these collections have this method inject, which takes the values in the collection and reduces it to a single value. And it does that by accepting an initial value, which is A, and then an anonymous function, which performs some operation on every one of the values in the collection carrying over the previous result. Uh, so in this example, the anonymous function is represented by the curly braces. We have two arguments to that anonymous function, sum and i, and then the uh, arrow notation uh, indicates the beginning of the body of that, of that function. So if you don't completely understand that, that's okay. We're going to come back to uh, this type of pattern again in some of the other languages. Now, uh, Groovy is a great language to use for building web applications, uh, and there are frameworks like Spring Boot and, and uh, Grails that, that, uh, that Groovy works with very well. But I think uh, a framework that best exemplifies the strengths of Groovy uh, is Ratpack. So Ratpack is a micro framework, a very light framework for building high performance HTTP web applications and web servers. Uh, the idea is it gets out of the way and lets you write your code and provides facilities for things like asynchronous and non-blocking I.O. Uh, so we can install Ratpack with SDK Man, uh, or we can install Lazy Bones with SDK Man, and we can use Lazy Bones to create a template Ratpack application. I'll call this DevOx. Uh, that template application will be Gradle-based. Gradle is a build tool analog analogous to uh, Maven, but it uses the Groovy language instead of XML to define your project structure. So you can see we have a, a build.gradle, which is a Groovy script defining our project, uh, and then a ratpack.groovy, which is sort of the entry point to our application. Uh, that default Ratpack Groovy script looks like this. Uh, it makes a few import statements like we would in a Java, uh, Java application. We import a static method called Ratpack. And then we invoke that Ratpack method uh, and pass it what is uh, technically an anonymous function represented by the curly braces. And then inside of that, we call other functions or other methods and pass them these anonymous functions. And that's 
That's mechanically what we're doing. But in reality, what this has created is a domain-specific language in which we can declaratively describe the Rat Pack application we're building up. So in this example, uh, we create the Rat Pack application. We're binding a module to our application that allows us to do some markup template stuff. Uh, we define a list of handlers. In this case, I'd have just the one uh, get handler that responds to all HTTP get requests uh, for the application. And then it renders this index.gtpl file, which is the groovy template language. Uh, this is another domain-specific language. Uh, this is the index.gtpl file. This is a domain-specific language for building up HTML using groovy code. Uh, so again, we're nesting the, uh, the methods that correlate to the uh, HTML tags inside of each other in the same way we were with our declarative Groovy script. Uh, many people like this because it allows you to use the Groovy syntactic sugar as you're building up your HTML. Um, personally, I, I'm just not a fan of it. I'm okay writing HTML. Uh, so that's a great example of how uh, Groovy can be used for domain-specific languages, uh, but it's also used for more powerful capabilities like uh, non-blocking I.O. So in this example, I'm creating a, another handler for my application. Uh, I want to get all of the dogs that are in my database. And it turns out there's a lot of dogs in my database. So this operation could take a long time. Uh, this select star from dogs could take minutes or more. Uh, so when a get request is sent to uh, my slash dogs path, uh, I don't want that thread of execution to block while the database is doing its work. I want to free it up so that my, uh, my web server can go, and go off and handle more requests while, the data, while it's waiting for the database. <clears throat> so what Groovy, or what Rat Pack provides for us is this blocking class and its get method. And we can pass an anonymous function to the get method, and inside of that anonymous function do some work that is blocking. Uh, and that, the blocking class will go and execute that anonymous function on another thread, and then when it completes, it'll execute another function, this, uh, the one that we pass to the then method, uh, where it will render the result of that database query. Uh, so in this way, we get all the benefits of asynchronous programming, uh, but we don't have to, or but we still get the guarantees that we, that we want with an imperative language where we're uh, having one thing execute after another. All right, so the strengths of Groovy are that it's lightweight, it's very easy to use, it's very quick to get things done, it's dynamically typed, it's object-oriented, it has a flat learning curve, which means that if you know Java, uh, your transition to, uh, to Groovy can be very linear. You can start by writing uh, just pure Java code and ease your way into the syntactic sugar of Groovy. It also has great Java interop, so if you're uh, using Groovy, you can continue to use all the languages or all the uh, libraries that you're uh, used to and enjoy in Java. The weaknesses of Groovy are that it's dynamically typed, so this is both a strength and a weakness depending on your perspective, uh, and it's also interpreted depending on how you use it. Uh, of course, it can also be statically compiled, uh, but you know, it's something to consider when you're, when you're choosing it. Now, if you like the uh, syntactic sugar of Groovy, but you are not a fan of this dynamic typing, uh, that brings us to Scala, which is a bit like the board. Uh, so Scala has gone around the uh, programming universe, and it's assimilating all of these different programming paradigms into a single hybrid language. <clears throat> Scala is both functional object-oriented, it's also statically typed, and has type inference. So it's this combination of things that we don't think of fitting together norm normally. Uh, so to demonstrate Scala, uh, I'll use the Scala REPL, which is a read eval print loop. Uh, when we run the Scala command, uh, we get this Scala prompt where we can write Scala code and have it executed immediately. <clears throat> so to demonstrate this type inference that I referred to, uh, if we create a new variable, in Scala, we use the var keyword. Uh, we create a variable i of type integer. Uh, but we could also define that variable without specifying its type and assign it a value. Uh, but unlike Groovy, in which the type is dynamic and we don't care, uh, the runtime still retains uh, a type for this variable. So if I attempted to reassign this variable as a string, I would get a type mismatch error because it is not a string. However, I could reassign it another integer value. That would be valid. And it's valid because this integer, or this variable, is mutable. I could also make the variable immutable using the val keyword. Uh, and this creates a variable similar to a final, using the final keyword in Java. And if I were to reassign uh, an integer to this variable, I would get a reassignment error. Uh, so Scala has a number of facilities for uh, making your, your 
classes and, and, uh, and objects immutable. Uh, it also has a great deal of syntactic sugar. Uh, for example, we can create ranges using this notation of 1 to 100. Uh, but the syntactic sugar in this example is not actually the two or the two key word. Uh, two is actually a method. And the syntactic sugar is that in Scala, uh, the dot and parens notation for invoking a method is, is optional. Uh, so this allows us to do some very powerful things with operator overloading because if you're calling plus or star or some other thing that would typically be an operator, it's really just a, a method call. Uh, it also has this underscore notation, which we can use in our anonymous functions. So if we wanted to uh, do a similar operation as we saw with the Gaussify method in, uh, in Groovy, uh, we would call fold left, which is analogous to the inject method. We'd pass an initial value. And then in our uh, anonymous function that's going to be executed against every one of the elements in our collection, <clears throat> we would call underscore plus underscore. These underscores reference the arguments uh, passed into this function. So this line of code is identical to the one below it, in which sum and v are explicitly spelled out as uh, parameters. But as long as we reference them in the right order, we can uh, shorten it to this underscore underscore notation. Uh, this can be very confusing, especially when uh, reading other people's code, but it's also very powerful. Uh, so most people uh, aren't using the Scala REPL day to day. They're putting Scala into .scala files and structuring things into classes and compiling them with uh, SBT, which is a build tool uh, like Maven, but for Scala. Uh, so this is just a simple example of a class. The class itself has uh, arguments, so to speak. Uh, in this case, we have a name and a surname as, as sort of arguments to the class. And Scala will define constructors and uh, 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 methods for, like sort of like getters and setters for these properties. So Scala can be used to uh, create web applications. There are a great deal of web frameworks uh, that, are, that are useful with Scala. But I'm sort of not interested in making a compelling argument for using Scala for web applications. I think Groovy and some other languages are, are better suited to that. Uh, I do think Scala is a great fit for uh, big data, specifically with Apache Spark. Uh, so Apache Spark is sort of like the new MapReduce. You have a master node, uh, and then it distributes some work off to a number of slaves, which uh, do their work, compute some result, uh, and then return a value or something back to the master, which rolls everything up. Uh, so I have a great example uh, on GitHub of a complete Spark application that estimates the value of pi. Uh, and you can just clone this and run Docker Compose, which will set, stand up the whole master-slave architecture uh, of Scala and estimate the value of pi. But inside of that example is really a single class, which is actually a singleton uh, class, which we can uh, define uh, with the object keyword in Scala. It has a main method, uh, and inside of this main method for the job, we're creating a Spark context. So every Spark application has a Spark context in the same way that like a web application would have a request context. Uh, we call sc.parallelize. Uh, so this algorithm for estimating pi is sort of like throwing darts at a dartboard and then just seeing which ones are closest to the circle. Uh, so parallelize is going to split up the different sections of our circle and send them off to the different slaves in our, in our uh, in our system. Uh, then each of those slaves is going to perform some calculations. So this is the anonymous function that we're passing into our parallelize. And then finally, the result will come back and we'll call reduce. And again, use this underscore plus underscore notation uh, to come up with an estimate of pi. All right, so the strengths of Groovy, or I'm sorry, of Scala are that it is functional, uh, has great support for concurrency, uh, and has great facilities for immutability. Uh, it also has static typing, which you know, is preferable for some people. Uh, the weaknesses of Scala is that it has a, a steep learning curve. Uh, so all of this syntactic sugar, all of these different paradigms uh, make it difficult to learn Scala. Uh, it also lacks orthogonality. So orthogonality is a characteristic of a programming language uh, in which it uses very few constructs to do lots of different things. Uh, Scala can do lots of different things, but also has lots of different constructs. Uh, so therefore, it lacks orthogonality. Uh, static typing can also be seen as a weakness based on your perspective. Uh, I also find uh, two weaknesses to be mutability. Uh, so while Scala has these facilities for immutability, uh, you also have the ability to shoot yourself in the foot at times. Uh, and I also find that uh, Scala has uh, poor Java interop. Uh, so if you go to a talk on Scala, uh, you will be told that, that Scala has great Java interop. You can call Java libraries and whatnot. 
But by comparison to languages like Groovy where, and, and JRuby, as we'll see, where it's very seamless, uh, very often when you're dealing with uh, Scala and Java libraries, you have to, for example, convert maps and lists into Java maps and lists. And then when you get values back, you have to convert them back into your, your Scala equivalents. So you end up with a lot of glue code. And uh, there's even a class in the Scala uh, standard library called Java conversions, which kind of facilitates all this. So if you like the functional nature of Scala, uh, but you're not interested in, uh, or you dislike the lack of orthogonality, uh, Clojure is another language to look at. So Clojure is a bit like Yoda. Uh, when we first see Yoda in Empire Strikes Back, we're like, this guy is kind of odd. We don't understand that he's even important. Uh, and that's, I think, very similar with uh, Clojure. It's, it's full of wisdom. Like, right, uh, Yoda's like this kung fu master, right? And, and Clojure has this sort of elegance and beauty to it, but it's also unassuming. Uh, Clojure, uh, well, Yoda is also very old. Uh, Clojure is not old, but it's an implementation of Lisp, which is uh, pretty much considered the second oldest still in use programming language behind Fortran. Uh, and Yoda also has this funny way of talking, you know, understand me later, you will. And uh, Clojure uh, is similar in that it uses prefix notation. So when we're uh, doing something like adding up numbers, we don't say 4 plus 2, we say plus 4, 2. And the reason for that is that everything in Clojure is a function, even the plus operation. Uh, so plus is really a function, and we're passing arguments to it. Uh, so th processing this uh, sort of uh, different way of saying things can be, can be challenging at times. Uh, so closure is purely functional. Everything is a function. And it also uh, is very strongly uh, immutable. You actually have to go out of your way to mutate things. Uh, so we'll play around with closure using another REPL, another read eval print, print loop. Uh, and we'll run that REPL using line again. So you don't actually install Clojure. Nobody installs Clojure. It's more of like a library that, that is pulled into an application. And we pull that in. Uh, the easiest way to pull that in is with line again, which you can install with SDK man. So when we run line REPL, we'll get this user prompt, which is our REPL prompt. And we can start writing Clojure code and have it evaluated. So we can run 4 plus, four plus 2 or make other function calls and pass them as arguments into our other function calls. Uh, again, nesting these parentheses, which is sort of the signature of a Lisp or of Clojure. Uh, while everything is a function in Clojure, uh, under the hood, we're still dealing with objects. So if we call the class function, what we're really doing is asking the number 42 what its class is. And we would find that it's a long or a string. Uh, aside, aside from the functions in Clojure, there are a few special forms, just a few things that are not functions. Uh, and those include uh, the if special form. Uh, but even when we use these special forms, we're still using them in the same way as if they are a function. Uh, so this if special form takes a conditional, which will evaluate to either true or false. And then it takes another function call, which it will evaluate if the uh, condition that's passed to it is, uh, is satisfied. Uh, so this is sort of unlike you might see in a method call in Java or something else, where you would expect this print line to be executed no matter what happens in the if special form. Uh, but the special form is special because it's lazily going to evaluate that print line call. If one is not, uh, or if that conditional is not true, we'll never see the yes printed out. We can also pass in a second function call, uh, which will be evaluated if the, uh, if the conditional returns false. So because everything in uh, Clojure is a function and we're not going to typically deal with classes, we have to have a way uh, in which to structure our data, in which we sort of contain it and pass it around. Uh, and that's why Clojure has great support for uh, collections and other types of data structures. So we can create range, we can create a range with the range function. Uh, we can also create lists with the list function. Uh, and we can also assign these uh, data structures as variables. Uh, using the def special form. So this is one of the other special forms. So if we were to call this list nums, uh, we could then use the first function to get the first value of it. We could use cons to uh, add a value to the front of it. So cons is interesting because it stands for construct. And uh, that's important because, as I said, everything in Clojure is immutable. So when we're adding a value to the front of a list, we're not actually mutating the list. We're constructing a new list. Uh, so we can check and see that nums still remains the same. Uh, again, everything being immutable in Clojure. Uh, we can also create maps, sort of like hash maps in Java. 
uh, and then we can define those uh, as a variable. Uh, the map itself is a function as well as a data structure. So we can call the person variable as if it were a function, pass it an argument, and get a result back. In this case, the, the name for, the, uh, for that key. Uh, but the keyword here, the, what's sort of like a symbol, uh, is also a function. And we can pass it, our variable, and get a result. So again, everything in Clojure is a function. All right, so well, well unlike uh, Scala, uh, in Clojure, you really do use the REPL on a day-to-day -day basis. Most Clojure shops where people are building and, and using Clojure on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis, uh, they're doing what's called REPL-driven development. And that is where you, you have your code, your Clojure code in .clj files, but you're sort of iterating on it and, and working with it by executing it continuously in this, in this REPL. So it's very similar, I think, uh, to test-driven development and where you're running your tests constantly, but in this case, you're actually executing these small functions that you're building up. Uh, and that's made possible because everything is a function, they don't have side effects, uh, and because things are immutable. Uh, so here's an example of creating a CLJ file that's uh, going to Gaussify again. It's going to add up a bunch of numbers and print out the result. Uh, but in functional languages, uh, things like for loops are kind of abhorred. Uh, looping is not really something that is seen as a good thing or is used in, uh, in functional languages. Uh, recursion is favored. So this is a recursive example of adding up these numbers. Uh, and if we wanted to execute this, we would load our file into the REPL, uh, and then we would run Gaussify and pass it a range. Now this function would work for very small ranges, but as soon as our range starts to get up to the hundreds, certainly the thousands, we're going to get a stack overflow error. Because each time we recurse into this function, we're creating a new stack frame, which incurs you know, more memory, and eventually we run out. Uh, so many uh, functional languages can optimize that. It's called like tail call uh, optimization, uh, and sort of flatten it out so that we're not creating new stack frames. Uh, but unfortunately, Clojure can't do that due to limitations in the JVM. Uh, so it adds a couple more special forms uh, that allow it to have this sort of recursive nature, nature uh, without creating the stack frames. And even though we don't want loops in functional languages, this special form is called loop. Uh, so this is a sort of a reboot of that previous function, uh, but using the loop special form. Uh, loop defines sort of a point in which we can recurse to within our function. Uh, so the loop uh, special form takes four, in this case, four arguments. Uh, they're actually two arguments with default values. So val is our first argument, the default value is a. Subset is our second argument, and its default value is R. Uh, so inside this loop, we're checking if the subset is empty. If it is empty, we're going to return the default value. And if it's not, we're going to recur, which is another special form that will send us back to the beginning of the loop, but with a different set of arguments. In this case, we're going to add up the, uh, the first value and then pass on the rest of the uh, range as a subset. And again, just load this file into the REPL and run it. So Clojure uh, is used to build many types of applications, including web applications. Uh, but in all cases, uh, we're not going to use frameworks. Uh, so frameworks in Clojure, or the word framework, is kind of like a dirty word. Uh, to a, if something is purely functional, it should be possible to use everything as a library. And that's because everything is a function, they don't have side effects, uh, and we have this strong immutability. Uh, that said, you need a way to conveniently build up an application. Uh, so there are sort of non-frameworks that uh, pull together a number of different libraries and using a number of conventions, set it up in a way that uh, just works very well. But it's not a framework. Don't call it a framework, you'll get in trouble. Uh, so we can use uh, Line again to create a new Luminous. Oh, I should say Luminous is my favorite of these uh, sort of non-frameworks. Uh, we can use Line again to create a new Luminous application. Uh, Line again knows where to find that template, and it will generate a new Line again project. Uh, so again, Line again is similar to uh, Maven, except that instead of XML, to define your project structure, it uses Clojure. Uh, so we have a project.clj file, which is analogous to our, our POM XML. Uh, Luminous also spits out a Docker file, a uh, proc file, and a bunch of other uh, things that you need for typical applications. Uh, the resulting template is sort of a fully functioning application. Uh, we can open it up in a browser after we run line run and, and use it. It'll connect to a, a database. 
Uh, when we start it up, we'll also see that it's starting an nREPL on a particular port. This nREPL, or network REPL, is a service that we can connect our REPL in uh, an IDE or an Emacs or something so that we can connect to this uh, process and, and execute things in the REPL in a sort of live fashion. And this is how most Clojure developers are doing their, their REPL-driven development. So if we look inside this Luminous application, uh, we have a web.clj file, which is sort of like, again, like the entry point, like we saw with Rat, Rat Pack, uh, defines the sort of layout of our uh, Luminous application. Uh, we have a number of routes that handle GET requests, uh, and those are just mapped to functions, which will then return some results. So if we were to load this file into our REPL that's connected to our, our nREPL, uh, we could call each of these home page or about page functions, and we would get back a map that includes our status code and our HTML. Uh, so most Clojure developers are taking applications like this, breaking things down into smaller functions, and then running those functions in the REPL, loading up their changes and, and, uh, and just constantly iterating in that way. So the strengths of Clojure are that it is functional, purely functional, it's highly orthogonal, uh, has strong support for immutability and for concurrency. Uh, its weaknesses are also that it's functional, uh, and it has a very steep learning curve. So as you've seen, it's very different from what you're used to in Java or, or even in other JVM languages like Groovy, uh, makes it difficult to learn. It's a little difficult to read, and it's, it's not very accessible. So these are challenges uh, for shops that are trying to adopt Clojure as a, a language of choice. Uh, I think this is kind of uh, exemplified by uh, a great XKCD comic, uh, this guy is reading a book on Lisp, and he falls asleep, and he has this dream where he sees the universe exposed in all of its patterns and meta patterns, like you know, these sort of pure functions that have no side effects. And he thinks to himself, this must be the language from which the gods wrought the universe. Uh, but God says, no. Uh, well, ostensibly, yes, but we really just hacked it together with Perl. And there's some truth to this in that closure and these Lisps are so elegant and beautiful, they're highly orthogonal. But at the end of the day, you just need to get stuff done sometimes. Uh, and I think there's no better language for just getting stuff done, rapidly uh, writing code, than uh, Ruby and its counterpart JRuby, which is Ruby for the JVM. Uh, JRuby is like Mary Poppins. It's, uh, it just kind of shows up from outside of the Java ecosystem, uh, and it brings in this spoonful of syntactic sugar that lets you just very rapidly build applications and. Uh, and enjoy writing code. Uh, JRuby is, like I said, it's coming from outside of the JVM ecosystem. So this is the one tool in which we can't use SDK man to install. Uh, you can either go to jruby.org to install JRuby. Uh, if you're already kind of familiar with the Ruby ecosystem, you can use RVM or tools like that. These are Ruby tools for managing Ruby runtimes, but they also manage JRuby. Uh, the Ruby syntax is almost identical to the Groovy syntax in many ways. Uh, and that's not a coincidence, like they rhyme for a reason. I think uh, the Groovy language is inspired by, by Ruby itself. Uh, so if we were to have our Gaussify method, we would use the def keyword to define a method. Uh, it's dynamically typed, so we don't have to specify the, the return type or the argument types. We also have an inject method, and so on. Uh, the only difference I can see here is the, uh, the syntax for creating that anonymous function, or what's called a closure. Uh, uh, Ruby has this do and then pipes notation for uh, the arguments and then the body of the, of the method. Uh, so it, uh, we would load this, uh, or put this code into an example.rb file and then run it with the Ruby interpreter. Uh, if you're using most uh, tools to install JRuby, you're still going to run the Ruby command even though you're using JRuby. Uh, one of the real powers of uh, Ruby is its ability to do metaprogramming. That is, code that writes code. Uh, so to demonstrate this, if, if you want to build a class, uh, or a class that has methods for Roman numerals, and you want to be able to handle every method call that is a Roman numeral, uh, that would be a difficult challenge to statically code. Uh, there's many, many combinations, maybe infinite combinations of Roman numerals. Uh, but in Ruby, if a method on a class doesn't exist, uh, it actually takes the name of the method that's called and passes it to another method called method missing. Uh, so in this method missing, uh, which you can override, you can sort of inspect the name of the method that was called and then apply some logic based on it. So in this case, I'm taking that name of the method, splitting it out into the different Roman numerals and then doing some math. And in that way, I can handle any, any Roman numeral call. 
This mechanism is used uh, in the framework Ruby on Rails uh, to, make a, to make classes that essentially have no code. Uh, so Active Record, which is a part of Rails, which I'll talk about in a second, allows you to extend the class, give it a name, and, and then it can have all kinds of behavior without, liter literally without writing any code. It's not atypical to see uh, an actual class in a, in, a, in a real application that looks like this. Active Record dynamically defines the methods and the properties and the behaviors of this class based on uh, convention. So it looks at what is in the database and derives it from the schema. Uh, Ruby also has uh, a mechanism called uh, modules, uh, which solve many of the same problems as aspect-oriented programming, where you can take cross-cutting concerns or these concerns that uh, that cut across all of the different classes, and you can apply them into your, into your classes without disrupting the inheritance hierarchy. So the best example of this is logging. Every one of your classes is going to do some kind of logging, uh, but you don't necessarily want to have everything inherit from a base logging class. Uh, the more sort of canonical example is the duck methods, uh, where you want a person to quack, or you want to, if, uh, this comes from the, um, uh, the term duct typing, uh, where a, an object in a dynamic language, an object, uh, how do you know if it's a duck? It's a duck if it quacks. So if we want a person to fit the duck sort of uh, expectations, we can include this module and allow it to quack. Uh, so as I mentioned, Ruby on Rails uh, is the most popular uh, Ruby framework. Uh, I don't have time to go too deeply into it, uh, but it's also the probably the best documented of the frameworks I've talked about today. Uh, you can once you have uh, JRuby installed, you can gem install Rails, run Rails new, and create a complete application. Uh, so this Rails is really designed to uh, do so many things for you that you don't have to write a lot of code. It generates models, controllers, views. Uh, if you're doing a REST API, it can generate the JSON for you. Uh, does database migrations, web sockets, asset pipelines. Uh, and this is really best exemplified by the Rails generate command, in which you can run Rails generate scaffold. Scaffold, give it the name of a resource, which will generate a model object and all of these other things uh, without having to write any code. All right, so the strengths of Ruby are that it's lightweight and dynamically typed, just like Groovy. Uh, it's still object-oriented, uh, has a, a good typing system. Uh, it's easy to learn, probably the easiest to learn of the languages we've seen, uh, and it has good interop with the Java APIs. So when you're invoking uh, methods on a Java library, that is very seamless. But on the weaknesses side, uh, it's not great at integrating with Java dependencies. So as I said, it comes from outside of the Java ecosystem. So if you want to include like a Maven dependency in your JRuby application, that can be challenging. Uh, its weaknesses are also that it's interpreted and dynamically typed. Uh, so the interpreted part does incur some kind of uh, performance hits, although most people will argue that it's negligible. All right, the next language we'll talk about, the last language we'll talk about is Kotlin, which is a bit like Harry Potter. It's sort of the new kid on the block, has a lot of potential, uh, but right now it still kind of needs Hermione to do anything of consequence. So uh, Kotlin is object-oriented, it's compiled, uh, and it's heavily influenced by its predecessors. So as we learn about Kotlin, we're gonna see a lot of syntax and features uh, that you can point to and say, ah, that comes from Scala or that comes from Groovy. So we'll look at uh, some simple uh, uh, Kotlin code. So this is, again, doing our iterating over integers and adding them up. We have a for loop that looks a lot like Groovy. We have the in keyword and the dot dot notation. Uh, but we're defining a function with the fun keyword. Uh, our, our argument types use this colon followed by the type, which is similar to Scala. Uh, so if we wanted to run this, uh, we would SDK install Kotlin. Oh, I didn't show that. I'll, I'll show that in a minute. Uh, so here's an example of a Kotlin class. Uh, again, a little bit like uh, Scala, where we're passing these sort of properties into our class definition. It can automatically create constructors and, and getters and setters, uh, but we can also uh, statically create our own constructors. Uh, one of the most interesting things about Kotlin to me is the, it, it, it's null safety. So by default, an object or a variable cannot be set to the value of null. Uh, this would actually result in a compile time error. So if we were to put this code into example.kt and then run Kotlin C, we would get an error because we're setting it to null. Uh, we can optionally make things nullable using the uh, question mark at the end of our type, uh, which will then allow us to, to make that work. 
Uh, this essentially prevents many of the most common errors in Java programs, that being null pointer exceptions. Okay, so each of the languages that I've talked about today, again, can be installed with SDK man. Uh, actually, Java itself can be installed with SDK man. Uh, if you're not using a bash system, if you're using Windows 10, uh, this works really well on bash for Windows too. Uh, if you want to learn more about each of these languages, uh, these are some resources. Uh, there's Groovy Cohen's. So Cohen's are these little short examples. Uh, in most cases, you can do them on the web, and they'll just walk you through some of the syntactic and, and other features of the language. Uh, Clojure, Ruby, and uh, Kotlin uh, all have Cohen's. Uh, for Scala, uh, I'm not aware of like a Cohen's type thing, but Scala Center has uh, a great number of resources as well. Uh, so again, my name is Joe Kuttner. Uh, I work at Heroku, and uh, thank you for coming. Questions? What's your favorite? Hmm. Hmm. Well, so I definitely like my favorite is Ruby, uh, but that's more based on my personal history. Um, I mean, like the, I actually enjoy writing closure code more than anything, uh, but I very rarely use closure day to day, and I think that's uh, I think that's a result of its accessibility. Uh, it's hard to get other people to write closure code. <laughs> Yeah, it's so, uh, yeah, I was intentionally short on it because I feel it's uh, sort of yet to be determined. Uh, more and more, so uh, just at this conference, I've talked to more and more people that are using Kotlin uh, for Android development, and I think that is probably uh, one of the emerging strengths. Uh, so Kotlin was created by JetBrains, uh, and of course they're using it to build their IDE, uh, and so I think it fits very well into uh, applications that are, uh, heavily sort of UI based, right? That has a uh, good support for asynchronous features and things like that. That's my take, but I think it's yet to be determined. Yeah. How, how related is Clojure Script to Clojure? So Clojure Script uses the Clojure uh, syntax, but it transpiles to JavaScript. And so, it gives you all the same expectations that you would have when you're writing closure for the JVM, uh, but at the end of the day, it's a completely different implementation. Uh, the, the main advantage of closure script is this sort of isomorphic thing that the, the Node.js people are always trying to get, where you have the same code on the, on the client side as on the server side. Um, I don't know if that's a pipe dream or if it's really something that's possible, but I do think uh, that using closure script with closure backends is uh, uh, a good path towards that. Let's say it again? Ex spell it? No, I haven't. I haven't even heard of it. Is, so this is a JVM language? OK. Yeah, that, there's, so there's, there's many more emerging JVM languages. I wanted to focus on ones that were a little bit more proved out. Like I said, four of these I've used in production. I know that they're solid and production ready. Um, but yeah, I keep seeing new ones. So extent is one. Uh, what's that? Oh, okay, well that's well that's interesting. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So that, yeah, that's a that's a great another option to look at. Uh, another one that I think is interesting is uh, uh, Freegy, which is sort of like a Haskell type of language, uh, but again needs more more proofing out. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Um, we don't have our Heroku booth anymore, but I'll be hanging around if uh, if you want to chat about Heroku or JVM languages. Thanks. Mm -hmm.